Partial funding for this program has been provided by Stephen T. Sawyer. broadcast for May 1st, 1949. If tonight's news isn't news, nothing ever will be. At exactly one minute past midnight, Hawaii's longshoremen officially went on strike. Contract negotiations begun January 26th are now at a standstill. ILWU leaders Jack Hall, Harry Bridges, and Louis Goldblatt urged employers to go into voluntary arbitration. But employers refuse, insisting that arbitration is passing the buck to a third party. You know, I'm a longshoreman. And us longshoremen, we deserve better wages. On the West Coast, they do the same work as us, handle the same cargo as us, work for the same company as us, only they get paid $1.82, while we get $1.40. We load the cargo here, they unload there. Only they get 42 cents per hour more. That's not right. Well, we want to make sure that the long term were, were paid decent wages, you know. And uh, our goal was to make sure that uh, we have the same kind of pay uh, as the Pacific Coast. That was the question, yeah. That was the question going around. How come that the West Coast has a better pay than the long term is the same cargo, same ship? Same company, same cargo. The other guy load them in, we unload them. Then we load in the cargo, they unload the cargo. Same thing they do it. Nobody wanted a longshoreman job was because the money was hard, the job was hard. The pay was small. Down here, the longshoreman was doing a better job and I, I challenged anybody in the world at that time that you couldn't do the work we were doing better than any place in the world. In 1945, the difference between hourly wages for longshoremen in Hawaii and the West Coast was 10 cents an hour. Now, in 1949, it's 42 cents. Same work, same companies, same cargo. Doesn't take a genius to figure out why these men went on strike. Listen. My husband, Barry, and I, we both know that a strike is serious. This strike is about wages and fair treatment, no matter what anyone says. Well, as the editor of one of Hawaii's daily newspapers, I have plenty to say. This strike represents an attack on free enterprise and capitalist integrity. Those mainland union leaders, Harry Bridges, Jack Hall, and what's his name? Goldblatt, Louis Goldblatt are nothing but communist troublemakers using our local stevedores to get a foothold in the islands. And there were no airplanes significantly in those days, and we were entirely dependent on those ships. And with the shipping strike, we were strangled. We really were strangled. I mean, uh, essential products began to run out, and it, it really made a very difficult situation for everyone. It was the most divisive thing I've ever seen in this community, and I never hoped to see it again. Uh, as far as trauma was concerned, obviously December 7 was a traumatic experience for this community, but it united the community. The dock strike just about tore the community apart. The central issue clearly was the continued existence of the labor movement in the territory of Hawaii. 5,000 longshoremen, uh, clerks on the waterfront, 
could completely close off the importation of all goods to the state of Hawaii, we were personified as the devil. This, of course, began to raise the deepest fears among the employers who felt, well, my God, here is a little union of individuals who are beginning to exercise the kind of power that they should not get because it affected every part of our life. Do you know what life was like here before, even now? There's these five big companies, Alexander and Baldwin, American Factors, Theo Davies, Castle and Cook, and C. Brewer. These guys have got their fingers into everything, and you can't even sneeze unless you get permission. Good evening. Tonight, our ILWU radio program presents a special speaker, Mr. Louis Goldblatt, Secretary Treasurer of the ILWU. Mr. Goldblatt. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to ask all of you listening tonight to remember the words of Abraham Lincoln. Labor is prior to and independent of capital. Capital is only the fruit of labor and could never have existed if labor had not first existed. And here in Hawaii, we would do well to remember that the great prosperity of the five big island companies now so opposed to a wage increase was built on the back of labor. There was work to be done, hard and dirty work. So they brought poorer people from other countries, the Chinese, Japanese, and the Filipino. Then, with long hours and poor wages, they earned dollar after dollar for their employers. All early attempts of workers to organize and bargain collectively were destroyed by the press and powerful employer interests. They think their old weapons of union destruction, terror and intimidation will work once again. They are mistaken. Those days are ended. They, they were in charge of Hawaii's economy. Hawaii economy was theirs. The Big Five didn't yield easily and graciously to uh, competitors coming in and they yielded least graciously at all to the longshoremen and the dock strike. You're not about to share either that kind of power with a trade union made up of what? Of individuals who were, at least in their eyes, not very well educated, who uh, could not speak English very well, and who were imported originally as laborers from Asian Pacific Islands and countries. Four days after the strike starts, I pick up the paper and I can't believe what I'm reading. Forget it, Barry. Just laugh it off. He's just a union buster. It's nothing to do with us. He just wants to bust a union. That newspaper editor is writing this editorial. And it's written like a letter from the union leaders to Joseph Stalin in Russia. This will rattle some teeth. Dear Joe, come on, Joe Stalin. We've got Hawaii all set up for you. It's a pushover. Easy. 2,000 men have tied up a community of 450,000. We've got more power than those big five. Next week, there'll be a 1,000 guys out of work because the plantations can't store their lousy sugar. In another two or three weeks, all the plantations will be shut down. You can't do better than that in Russia, can you, Joe? Well, that's Lauren Thurston. And uh, the, things that he's, the things that his paper uh, said about the union people were scurrilous and debasing, debasing. Those editorials tried to show that there was an international conspiracy between the local union and an international communist party. Part of that whole thing was to whip up the fears of people. It was a, the beginning of the McCarthy period. And it, here, locally, it was also the time in 1947 when two school teachers who are now dead, John and Ike Reinecke, were fired. <laughs> Here we were, we just came back from a war. We had placed ourselves in jeopardy and in harm's way. We had felt that our patriotism uh, had been established and our loyalty to the country was firmly established. 
But with these charges, and they were being aimed at our uncles, our cousins, in many cases, our parents. So we felt personally hurt, and uh, we resented that. Well, Joe Stalin, I understand we might need the thought police. The other day, someone compared us union leaders to colea birds. A colea bird flies to Hawaii from the mainland, thin, tired, and hungry, and he stays long enough to get fat off the land and then flies away, leaving a mess behind. We can't have dangerous thoughts like these, Joe. Good evening. This is the nightly ILWU broadcast. That Dear Joe section of the newspaper, which rightly belongs on the comic page, really contained a dilly today. It concerned Kalea birds. It would be a good idea for that editor to look to his own family tree and the trees of his supporters for the grandpappies of all Kalea birds. They came here some hundred years ago. They found the picking so good they decided to stay here. Not only did they raise kids, but with a little fast talk, they picked up almost all of the property owned by Hawaiians. I'd like to wring his neck. Bob McElrath didn't respect anybody at all. I mean, he, he came out with what he thought was the absolute truth, and he didn't care how the chips fell. And Bob McElrath was a complete trade unionist, more to the left than lots of other trade unionists were. And it was really a, a rabble-rousing little program he put on. It was very difficult for people to hear. And he had information sources. This was a, a, an aspect of union. They had good research background on the employers. And Bob was able to come up with facts and figures and data about the employer books and about employer so-called secret meetings that he would describe on the air. Uh, he was absolutely fun to listen to. <laughs> it doesn't take a 50-year resident to look back and remember when a kid on the plantation didn't even have a pair of shoes. Because of the ILWU and other unions, working people in Hawaii are able to buy decent things. There's a price for improving the standard of living here. And our editor friend doesn't want to pay his share. We worked hard to build this union because we knew it was our only chance for a better life. We support our leaders, Jack Hall, Louis Goldblatt, and Harry Bridges. Harry Bridges was very intelligent, and he was able to talk convincingly to working people. And he was willing to take all the bad names that came with communist accusations. He didn't give a damn. Jack Hall was a, a difficult man to get to know. But he was a marvelous negotiator, a, a marvelous man in so many ways. I mean, he, his word was his bond. He was honorable. He worked for a very small salary. The union paid them peanuts, all of them. He was uh, also tremendously in, intelligent and very well read. He'd spend all of his non-working time reading, drinking too, but, uh, but mostly reading. His uh, connection with, with the rank and file was very close. Lou Goldblatt, for instance, was a man who gave strong leadership in the West Coast International. While all this stuff is going on, the newspaper, the radio, our union leaders are trying to work for a settlement. We're asking for a 32 cent per hour raise. That's $1.72 an hour for us. Well, as a representative for the employers in these negotiations, uh, I have to say I think a 32 cent raise is way out of line. 32 cents makes the wage gap between us and the West Coast men 10 cents. They make $1.82 an hour. Well, that is just too high of an increase and certainly not in keeping with wages or wage increases in Hawaii. Why already, stevedores make more than other workers do in similar industries. Utility workers make $1.30, uh, bus operators $1.22, pineapple and sugar workers make much less. Oh, real rough, sugar. 
hundred pounds sugar you used to carry with your hands, you know. Pineapple, uh, she, it's about 65 pounds a, uh, a case, you know. Stack them up about 12 high. You know, we used to sweat like hell and, you know, and every day when I used to get through working, I used to go drink beer just to put back all that water that I lost. But it still was hard money here. Everything was hard money. Oh, boy. <laughs> but manpower, those days we never had, we never had lips. All, all trailers, you know, with the handle with, where they, they unroll the cargo on the bar, they put them on a trailer, you push it by hand, go in the, in the pier and sort it out. They were mostly Hawaiians. Because Hawaiians, they are good workers. They pass workers. But they get short, short time. You want something done, you get a Hawaiian crew there. They had coal used to be the, 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 the fuel, the energy fuel for the plantations. They used to shovel it in, in huge baskets, big baskets about this big. There was no such thing as a protection for your health. Nothing of that mass that you, nowadays that is really strict for you working. I do tell them, yeah, see whether it's all blood money, because you have to all but a hand, you know, you're not my machine. In a ship, you walk all with hand, all manpower, they call that. Wages in Hawaii should be determined by local conditions, similar to workers in the same locality and business conditions in general. Before the strike, we made an offer of 12 cents. Now, that's a damn good increase. The membership of our union voted down a 12 cent offer. Now we're on strike for 32 cents, but we're still open to discussing other figures. They just kissed off that 12 cents like it didn't mean a thing. 12 cents? It doesn't mean a thing. There was a mass rally today, May 17th, at Kapiolani Park to call for an end to the strike. 10,000 people showed up. Gentlemen, as you know, the members of our union will return to work immediately and will perform work under existing conditions once you submit the wage issue to a fair and impartial third party for a final and binding decision. There is absolutely no reason for this strike to continue one hour longer other than your refusal to accept the American principle of arbitration. May we hear from you immediately. The ILWU leadership would like nothing more than to strip the employer of his right to run his own business. They reason the best way to do this is to make it impossible for the employer to say how much of a wage he will pay his employees. This is what the arbitration of wages does. It takes away from management a vital part of its right to manage. It passes the buck to a third party who has no responsibility for the success or failure of an industry. My guess is that uh, they were so adamant against arbitration because arbitration I think was viewed as more favorable to the weak side. And they thought they had the strong side. And they didn't want to, they didn't want to give in. We agreed from the beginning to unload all military cargo and to work all ships with food, medical supplies, or perishables. We also unload the mail. So nobody is going hungry or suffering physically because we're on strike. On May 28, 1949, at Port Allen on the island of Kauai, 12 striking stevedores were arrested for upsetting automobiles. Uh-oh. Apparently, the automobiles were attempting to cross the picket line and enter the pier area. The men were charged with malicious injury and obstructing the highway. The car that were overturned uh, were people that uh, were crossing the picket line. You know how it's going to start. Everybody's going to get getting madder and madder. And I have to run out from there because I was shot. And all those big guys, you know, they had to hide the car and I was underneath. I don't want them to know with me, so I had to run away. <laughs> I was one of them. For one year, we had a register at the courthouse. Every month, we have to go down there because of what we did on a strike. But there was nothing mean about it. 
just you wanna you know confronted with you know, striking you people are humbugging us so. but the big news of today may 31st is the wahini picket demonstration out in front of the ilwu headquarters at 10 o'clock this morning about 150 women dropped down to union headquarters and proceeded to picket the strikers some of these women stepped out of chauffeur-driven limousines with signs attached to the end of brooms. I gather the idea is to sweep the islands clean of the so-called wicked union leaders. They're calling themselves the Broom Brigade. Get honest leaders. Your families suffer while your leaders prosper. We are for good unions. I'm sure that's the first time some of those women ever picked up a broom in their lives. I asked one woman just what a good union was. A good union is one that doesn't strike. I can't believe this. You know, I went down there to look, and those ladies had lunch delivered to them from the Royal Hawaiian Hotel. After lunch, some 40 gals took off from the line and paid a visit to our governor, Ingram Stainback. Now, I don't know if there was a reporter from Vogue or Mademoiselle in the crowd, but if there was, those magazines would have a great idea of what the well-dressed picket is wearing these days. Well, after being told the governor was in conference, the women began chanting and stamping their feet. We want the governor. We want the governor. We want the governor. Hey, Joe Stalin, how do you handle wahines? Uh, help! Joe, I've looked in all your books. We followed your plans pretty good. Damn the bosses, smear everyone, cause race hatred, cuss out the rich, play tough luck on the poor. But how do you handle wahines? And you know, Joe, we can't sock them or just get rid of them with no questions asked over here. It's part of the stupid American system to think their dames are okay. Broom Brigade were a bunch of ladies, uh, women, I'm not sure all of them were ladies, who decided that the, the cause of breaking the strike or pushing our, the employer's viewpoint of the strike would be served if they would pick it. And here these ladies would come down, get out of their cars, in some cases chauffeur-driven, carrying with them the brooms, and they would march around in a circle down in front of the Matson headquarters. They'd come down P9, the broom brigade with the broom, you know. But we never, there was no cussing going around or nothing. I don't know if they respected us, but we did. I'd remind the guys, you know, hey, some of them can be your mother, so shut up. Don't let those mainland union bums wreck our Hawaii. Someday you will see the truth. That's right, Joe Stalin. We have to be especially careful not to let our Filipino Union members know the truth. We have to keep them from thinking. If they ever understand how in all innocence they're being led around and are being used, they will quit following us. They're very loyal people, Joe. They usually believe any man who can talk smart, wears good clothes, and acts like a big shot they don't know that Harry Bridges is branded a communist. If we lose them as members, that might bust our strike and bring harmony and goodwill back to Hawaii. We can't let them know the truth. We'll never get their loyalty again, even by force. Filipinos are that way. In response to the racially insulting remarks in the Dear Joe column today, which by no stretch of the imagination could we dignify with the term journalism. We have invited Brother Nick Sebulbaro, who holds one of the top leadership positions in the ILWU Local 152. Welcome, Brother Sebulbaro. Good evening, fellow Filipinos and union members. I am surprised at the low mentality of the person who writes Dear Joe editorials. In spite of the cheap kind of propaganda, by this Dear Joe editorial writer, we Filipinos, like all the other races in the ILWU, are not blind and dumb followers to the dictates of Jack Hall, Harry Bridges, and Louis Goblat. These are our leaders, but not our bosses. 
So, fellow countrymen, stand firm under the banner of our union. No matter how much red baiting and racism the newspaper inflicts on us and our union, the ILWU. I thank you. It's like I said, we worked hard to build this union. Eight years now we've been working. We know what we're doing. When there's a wage proposal, it goes out to the rank and file and everyone votes. We've got all kinds of races in our union. For years, the company tried to keep us apart. Now that we're united, we're a strong force. And we say an injury to one is an injury to all. For we are all brothers and sisters under the skin. Well, in the early days, when I worked with Harry, he taught me how to go about how to organize, how to do, and what the whole thing is all about. Eh? Something that we got to believe in, see. You see, not the Hawaiians say, makawa hawale no, see. I mean, just by the lips, see, the, we take it from inside. See. And when we do something, we're not doing that thing mostly for us, it's for everybody, see. no matter who they are. It's for the benefit of the working people. We had night meetings, secret meetings, you know, and uh, almost every night we had our own meeting. And uh, we were discussing about the jobs, and we were discussing about the condition, and we were discussing about the employer and the bosses, you know, how to overcome. As we move into June, the strike starts to wear on everybody. No one is starving, of course, but shelves on the supermarket aren't what they used to be. Lots of people can't do business, so unemployment is rising. The hospitals say they're short on anesthetic and bandages. The mortuaries say they need embalming fluid. The bakeries say they're almost out of yeast. But the biggest complaint you'll hear from everyone is it's really hard to find this. We know there are some shortages. But we continue to unload relief ships with food and medical supplies. We even tried to make some provision so that the Lurleen could continue to sail because we know tourism is important. Under our proposal, the HVB would hire Union Stevedores at $1.72 an hour. We're not willing to toss our strike overboard, but we want to do what we can. They told us we should work the Lurleen at the old rate of pay. <laughs> Forget it. My Lurleen lies over the ocean. My learning lies over the sea. My learning lies over the ocean. Oh, bring back my learning to me. There are all these anti communist groups in town. They're getting people all worked up about communist infiltrators and Russian invasions. The Hawaii Residents Association, IMUA, and the Citizens Committee of Hawaii are playing on the worst kinds of fears. Sometimes I see people on the street who know me and Barry, know that we're committed to the union, and they cross the street. Today, my son came home from school crying. One of the other kids called him a commie rat. My personal assessment is that there's no doubt there were communists and members of the Communist Party in the trade unions at that time, principally the ILWU. The Communist Party, in my opinion, as an organization, did not have a real influence over the way ILWU was organized and run. But I do think that individual communists with their philosophy of justice, of equality, with sharing power, in fact, provided the kind of glue that was important to keeping the group together, the working people together. And the employees were uh, helping to convince the uh, uh, people and uh, that the strike was a communist-led strike for the purpose of overthrowing the government. And I said, no way did we discuss anything like that when I was a secretary of the strike committee, that 
There was nothing like that uh, going on. You know, not one word was said about communists trying to take over the government. I didn't believe anything about that. I, I didn't believe that, uh, uh, that they were communists or what. Governor Stainback has appointed a fact-finding committee. The board is to conduct a seven-day hearing and present its recommendations for a strike settlement. It is well known the governor is no friend of the union. Lou Goldblatt was there to represent union interests. <laughs> Calling it a fact-finding board is a very weird stretch of the imagination. They'll most likely submit some kind of proposal that's pre-approved by the employers. Well... I see Mr. Goldblatt has already begun his well-planned and vicious attack on the employers. All we want to do is re-establish the wage pattern that existed three years ago between Hawaii and the West Coast. Dear Joe, got your last from Russia. I see you're wondering exactly what we mean by wage parity. It's one of the greatest arguments we've got, just like demanding arbitration. It sounds fair, too makes the public think the employers are unfair, which, of course, we want. Now, Joe, we don't really care what the boys make, just so long as we can get everyone else upset because they don't make what stevedores do. Forcing the lousy employers to pay more and more increases the cost of living, causes bankruptcy, distress, hardship, suicide, heart failure, and more important, revolution. Then comes that day, Joe, when we can take over. They had the uh, Dear Joe editorial right in the headline, front page, every day of the strike. To Dear Joe, uh, this is what your boys are doing here in Hawaii, you know, to help you out. And they were trying to uh, convince the people that the, the strike was run by communists. The fact-finding board submitted its report. They recommended a 14 cent wage increase. Today, on June 30th, Levi K. Aloha, union vice president, has announced that the union has rejected the recommendations of the fact-finding board. 1,620 strikers cast their ballots. 149 voted to accept the offer. But 1,467 voted against the proposition and are determined to continue to strike for better wages. They turned down 12 cents, now 14 cents. Believe me, any offer after this will be substantially below 14 cents. Negotiating has turned out to be a waste of time. Most of us prepared for the strike. We stocked up on food and tried to set money aside, but mortgages, doctor bills, utilities, everything keeps coming in. Sometimes we go to the union soup kitchen. See, if you belong to the union and you need to eat, you and the family can always go there for some kind of meal. I remember going to the Union Hall and, ha and having, you know, eating there with all the families. I remember when the uh, men would get off of the picket line, they'd come up either by themselves or some of them would bring their families up to have a, have a meal. There were people who paraded, demonstrated every day. But then there were other people who didn't do that at all. They had other jobs. So we had hunting committees. We had scrounging committees. And uh, the amount of help was uh, significant. Let's say it was enough to feed people every day. I would say 150 people every day for at least two meals a day. Every chance we had to go out fishing, we'd go out and try to catch as much fish as we can. And we did a pretty good job going fishing, you know. And my brother used to be the head of the hunting group. Every week they go, they come home with six, seven goats, and that lasts pretty good too for the whole week. Communism is a real threat to these islands. Our battle against communism has just begun. Are you strikers free men or communist slaves? In addition to their brooms and their silly false slogans, the Broom Brigade gals started passing out leaflets listing alleged communists in the territory. The leaflet was that old red herring, the Roberts Report. Never mind that it's not the government document they pretend it is. Never mind that 99% of it is nonsense. 
These gals will do anything to help whip up red baiting and hysteria as weapons against the strike. With us again this evening is Mr. Lou Goldblatt, who has more thoughts to share. Across the nation, charges of communism are constantly used to undermine the labor movement and to silence the voices that speak out for social justice. Hysterical cries of communist infiltration and invasion resulted in the formation in 1945 of the House Un-American Activities Committee and its ensuing witch hunts. Accusations of communist unions causing strikes and social chaos are now fashionable platforms for politicians hungry for recognition and power. Now, shortly after the ILWU began in Hawaii, the employers and the public press launched a similar campaign of lies and abuse against us. We are accused of being agents of Moscow, of trying to communize Hawaii, of overthrowing religion, destroying schools, and of causing the bankruptcy of the territory. As we have said, such a campaign is nothing new, but this one is perhaps unmatched in the history of our nation. In fact, when they know you in a, in a union, you communists. So I ask uh, one of an educator uh, if he, he was willing to interpret the meaning of communist. So the way I got it, communist is for common cause. Well, they were calling the union communist anyway. Just go into here and come out to the other here. We, you know, figure out, oh, well, that's nothing. It's only, only people talking, so. Never bother me. I know never bothered me. <laughs> I didn't care. I didn't care. And plenty of the strikers, too, had the same feeling. No, just don't bother them. 104 union men were arrested today for disorderly conduct at Pier 9. The men were blocking the entry of a truck that was trying to unload the ship Hawaiian Citizen. Pickets were charged with restraining people by force or violence from working. Charges were later changed to obstructing a public highway because technically no violence occurred. As July gets hotter, so does the strike. And now some friends of the employers have started the Hawaii Stevedore Limited. They rented equipment and are hiring men at $1.40 an hour. Just another move to break our union. Can you imagine how the strikers must feel when they see these scabs working on a ship? Yesterday, July 16th, 96 union men were arrested at Pier 29 for disorderly conduct when they tried to stop a busload of scabs from crossing the picket line. Tempers are flaring. Unemployment in Hawaii has increased by 8,000. Lots of small businesses are hurt by the strike, but the big companies don't care. They can afford to hold out and not negotiate. The union is standing firm, but things are getting edgy. There was my oldest brother. He was a supervisor, you know. See? And he was all out to see me that I get up from the strike and get back to work. And I told him, no, no, no. That I won't do. I won't do that. Because these are the people that I'm living with and working with. So I'm going to be with them until I die, I see. Some people had come to our apartment and threatened our lives. So what happened was my dad and dad's men would come and pick us up um, early evening and take us down to where Jack Hall lived. I think it was someplace by um, Hawaiian Village, someplace around there on the beach area. And we, we, my brother and I would sleep on this big army truck and about five or six of his men would parade the beach, walk the beach area, and, and watch over us during the night, and we'd go back home in the morning. And the people were really, really frantic. And I was really frantic because I said, no, we've got to really take care of the people. And we, if they have to man the boats with the National Guard, I said, let's man the boats. 200 to 300 men stormed the offices of the scab organization Hawaii Stevedores Limited. Knives, bricks, clubs, and bottles were all used in this short but vicious fight. 24 persons have been injured. 30 men are under arrest for rioting and assault and battery. Lucky for the union, we have two really good lawyers who go to bat for us whenever we're in a legal scrape. They work in the courts to protect the union's rights. Meyer Simons and Harriet Booslog. They did wonderful things for the working people. The, the laws that uh, we now think of with awe, you know, we think 
Hawaii has the greatest laws of the labor laws than any state. All over the mainland, there are opinions and publicity about our strike. A handful of Moscow adherents in the islands, operating chiefly through the ILWU, has persistently sabotaged the economic life of the territory. Harry Bridges of the ILWU is the unseen communist dictator of Hawaii. Senator Hugh Butler, the New York Times. Beneath their mask of democracy, Hawaii's rulers are staunch advocates of white supremacy. The longshore strike has made this painfully clear. Non-white labor, like Negro labor on the mainland, has had to fight against the handicaps of color, as well as the traditional battle of trade unions against management. The Black Dispatch, Oklahoma. Governor, all strikers, if there are more than 50, should wear special badges and armbands if they are in a public place, numbered and issued by the authorities. Everyone would then know who the strikers are and could refuse to serve them. A. Jepper, Seattle. Declare a state of emergency and put the islands under martial law. Arrest all striking union members and their leaders. Shoot the leaders for treason. Take citizenship away from union members. Give them 30 years labor at the docks at no pay. And after 30 years, shoot them for treason. Sincerely, a citizen of the United States of America. Recently, ladies and gentlemen, someone brought an article to my attention in a mainland newspaper glorifying the gals of the Broom Brigade, calling them courageous and sisters in democracy. Tonight I'd like to read a letter I received from one of these courageous sisters of democracy. It is addressed to... The ILWU leaders. Having been a daily picketeer for five weeks, I want you to know that people are getting wise to your way of doing things. And people are going to learn from me that this strike is not a wage dispute and that the women of Honolulu will continue to fight until we oust your crooked leaders and mouthpieces for a couple of thousand dumb people. Everyone knows why you married Orientals. You had better order your coffin now, because you will be dead when this is over. Now, with that kind of publicity going on and the Daily Dear Joe editorials, there's no way in which we could have escaped the legislature's enacting a dock seizure law. Today, August 6th, Governor Steinbach signed into law the Dock Seizure Act. The territory of Hawaii has seized the docks and will now take over the stevedoring services. The governor says... Because it is essential to the public health, safety, and welfare, it is necessary that the government be authorized to take over and operate the stevedoring at the docks to open and keep open the commerce of the ports of the territory of Hawaii. Public health, safety, and welfare? What's he talking about? There may be economic and business hardship, but relief ship cargo is being unloaded. Everyone is healthy here, no one is starving, and tourists are still visiting. There's no physical hardship. The whole city was in was written. You know, you wanted to buy this thing, you didn't have it. You, the business were going bankrupt, they couldn't pay the employees. The employees would be laid off. And uh, then we, we don't, didn't know how long it would last. The federal government wouldn't help us. And we were, we were at the mercy of, uh, of the people at the docks. And so we had to pass the docks procedures uh, law to really grab hold of the docks so that we can really operate. Today, all the men voted to declare any cargo loaded by the territory of Hawaii as hot. And already, support for our union comes pouring in from up and down the West Coast. Today, this cable was sent to Governor Ingram Stainback. This is to inform you that the 6,000 longshoremen in the Northwest will not unload one pound of scab cargo that is loaded by strike breakers. Your strike-breaking efforts on behalf of the big five companies of Hawaii are not different from the strike-breaking efforts used by Hitler and Mussolini. All decent workers of the United States and its territories are in a position to and will support the Hawaiian longshoremen. From Bill Geddes, Northwest Regional Director, ILWU. They figured that uh, the longer they uh, held up, you know, 
the weaker we're going to be. But we came just the opposite. We came stronger and stronger as the days went by because we had more uh, people supporting us from outside. Uh, they figured that our issue was correct. You know, equal pay for equal work. Yesterday afternoon, August 15th, the Attorney General was granted a circuit court order to keep the ILWU from picketing at the docks. Now today, in defiance of the court order, who were the two lone pickets at the docks? None other than ILWU leader Harry Bridges and Teamsters leader Art Rutledge. Bridges told reporters he wanted the attention of the Supreme Court. Bob McElrath happened to be there and he went up to the deputy sheriff and he says, look, why don't you do this? Take the injunction and tear it in half. Give one half to Art Rutledge and give the other half to Harry Bridges and you will have served it. And the deputy sheriff looked at Bob and says, Oh, I can't do that. <laughs> I can't do that. And Bob thought it was so funny and, and he just howled with laughter. Finally, Harry Bridges picked up the injunction, stuck it in his pocket and said, I'll take care of it. <laughs> This is the fifth month of the strike and everyone is feeling the pressure. Something everyone fails to realize is that the people who suffer the most during the strike are the strikers themselves. The Department of Public Welfare stopped any payments to longshoremen on strike. Everybody owes money all over town. Some families have had to ask for extensions on their mortgages and deferments on their payments for their children's school. Not to mention the other expenses that keep coming up. Sometimes it seems like everything is against us. A lot of them was against us. A lot of them was against us. <laughs> Sometimes I couldn't blame them because everybody was going through hardship that six months. You know, I knew that. But I never knew we were going that six months. I mean, it would take that long, you know? I did a lot of educational work among the longshoremen so that, in fact, what we did was we trained a lot of longshoremen, really trained them as to how they could approach bank managers to forestall payments on loans. Yes, they had women auxiliary. Those were the auxiliary's jobs, is to get around to the, to the strikers over here and then see what the extra needs were needed. By late September, more people are jobless and food prices have risen about 6%. 500,000 tons of sugar worth over $60 million is piled up. Four of the big five own 40% of Matson's stock, and Matson has been losing about $800,000 a month for the last five months. Oh, hey, Joe Stalin. Here's a little up-to-date dope. We sure like people who can stay calm and collected. Don't see why anyone should be upset. Just because 20,000 people are out of jobs, just because everyone has to take a pay cut, just because the sugar industry might fold, and when the pineapples start rotting, the canneries can shut down too. It's all going according to plan. And it's much better if people just take it as a matter of course. No other American community has ever been so tied up, Joe. And we sure hope you'll say, well done, Ski. I think most of the people felt that the ILWU had brought a measure of equality to the lives of working people, and they were not about to believe everything that was published in the newspapers. <laughs> You tell me why the employers would rather lose so much money instead of giving us a fair raise. You tell me why they resist fair negotiations and at every turn refuse impartial arbitration. You tell me whether or not you think their main goal is to exterminate real unionism in the Hawaiian Islands. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Reliable sources say that union leader Harry Bridges is engaged in informal talks with Matson higher-ups in the Fairmont Hotel in San Francisco. It is rumored that the union and the employer representative are not too far apart on a settlement. It's October now, and Harry Bridges is in Honolulu meeting privately with employer representatives at a house in Kahala. On this morning of October 5th, 
at 8.40 a.m. at the Honolulu airport. Before Harry Bridges stepped aboard his flight for the mainland, he announced, and I quote, I have negotiated a settlement of the longshore strike in off-the-record discussions. I am recommending that the union accept it. It is for a wage increase of 21 cents an hour, 14 cents on return to work, and a further 7 cent increase payable on February 28, 1950. The employers, of course, have their own version of the settlement. And now, uh, we see this settlement in a slightly different light. We have agreed to a 14 cent raise. Uh, we accepted that months ago at the suggestion of the fact-finding board and accepted again in order to end this long ordeal. Oh, well, yes. Uh, in order to safeguard against another possible strike, we uh, have agreed to an additional seven cents in February 1950. Okay, Lee. Let's see if I can add correctly. If I have 14 cents and I add seven cents, I get 21, 21 cents. <laughs> Not everyone is so happy. The Employers Council called a special meeting and many of us spoke out against this 14 cent plus formula. In my opinion, it amounts to surrender to a bunch of union reds. Ladies, although our picketing has stopped, only the first portion of our work has been completed. We organized for two purposes, to help alleviate the stranglehold of the ILWU and to fight communism. For future action, we propose that all women who have not already done so become members of IMUA, the Hawaii Residents Association and the Citizens Committee of Hawaii. There, in the legislature, we will work for the development of an un-American activities investigation. The lingering anti-communism which was fostered by the whole eager, uh, era of McCarthyism persisted. The fact that we won the strike did not mean that there was an end to the red baiting that persisted in the state of Hawaii for a number of years thereafter, and which, as you know, culminated in the arrest of the so-called Hawaii Seven in uh, December of 1951, when they were indicted on the basis of violation of the Smith Act, which was uh, to teach the overthrow of the United States government by force and violence. On October 23rd, 1949, the final terms of the settlement are ironed out, and the strike is over. It has been 177 days. We are all happy and look forward to getting on with our daily lives. And although the strike has been hard on everyone, we know that in the long run, this gives all working class people a chance to build a decent life for themselves and their families. Our strike will have made a difference. Well, I think when we won our strike, but I think all the other unions really looked up to us, though. I mean, I, I mean when we won that 49th strike. I think that we've got to doff our hats to those workers who stuck by the union, who stuck by their leaders, despite everything that was thrown at them. Disloyalty, willing to overthrow the government, causing the starvation of young babies, all of those things which were thrown in their face, but they stuck with the union and they won that strike. The power was in the plantation. The power was right there on the waterfront. The 1949 strike dramatized that and made it very clear. We came out of it a stronger community. I think uh, we came out of a community in which uh, labor finally had an equal place at uh, tables of power along with, with business, and business didn't yield that easily. Everybody was happy then. I mean, the point the, point the long showman was concerned. Everybody's happy because we got the wage, the wage increase. In fact, that's what we went out for, just the I mean, same parity with the mainland. That's right. We uplifted the living conditions of, of uh, 
uh, union families. And not only union families, non-union families benefited also. I felt it was a, a, a great victory for us working, working people because we had what we really wanted is, was the wages that the, uh, those other people have and that we wanted the same thing too. An injury to one and this is an injury to all for we are all brothers and sisters. Not on the surface, maybe under the skin. Because when you cut the blood, you might be dark. We cut, red blood come out. If you get any other kind of blood, call you doctor. <laughs> <laughs> Partial funding for this program has been provided by Stephen T. Sawyer.